You're with us on the Football Fever podcast, proudly sponsored by One Malaysia, Cardiff City. And we are talking about uh, comings and goings from last season and also for the season ahead. David Beckham saying goodbye with uh, PSG after a storied career. 38 years of age, he won championships in four different countries. Somebody wittily remarked that uh, his final game was appropriate because he was um, touching up Brest. You know, 3-1 victory over Brest. Well, it's an appropriate <laughs> remark from the 1970s, maybe. <laughs> I'm just, just uh, repeating a headline that I saw. So, uh, David Beckham, of course, was a teammate of yours, Paul, back in the day at Manchester United. I mean, do you have to pinch yourself and think, this is 2013, there's a 38-year-old guy out there who's been uh, playing pretty good football? He's been playing football. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's been pretty good, let's be honest. I mean, he, two of those medals, it can count. Of the Manchester United, yeah, he won, I think he won six Premier Leagues. I mean, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Um, he got the one in Spain, but I think that was more by default. The fact of Capello in the end was putting him on when the game was won. You can't really count the one in America. And the one in France, I mean, well, he was it's getting given. put on late in the game as well. That was given. That was a given anyway. So it sounds good in theory, written in black and white, but in, it's, it's a myth really. And... I was a bit disappointed about the crying at the end in Paris. He's only been there two minutes. <laughs> well, know? it's the end of his career. I mean, not his, just his PSG yeah, career. Yeah, I know, but still his career. I mean, a lot of people said his career ended in 2003 when he Five left Manchester. Five years ago. Well, he left Manchester United. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he went to Madrid and, I mean, people say he'd done well, but it was okay. But after that, Madrid, I mean, once he went to America, that was finished. But I, I used to bring Dave back, back, drive him back to London quite regularly, yeah. Because you both were from, uh, both from, from London both area. from East London. And you, I used to take him home when he shouldn't have been going, but I used to take him home and then pick him up in the early hours of a Monday morning before we trained and virtually had to get him out, drop him off outside the training ground before the cliff and get him to walk in so he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't in my car in the morning. And how was he like as a person? Yeah, what inkling did you have that he would become such an um, icon? Well, I didn't. You, you, <laughs> never got, you never got that initially because the best, the best players was um, Paul, Paul Scholes was the best player by far. And still finished up as the best player by far. Um, so I had Nicky Butt, who was keeping Dave at where he wanted to play in the middle. So Dave was just an ordinary, nice kid. He was, you know, he used to chat and everything. And all of a sudden, he went the other way, the way of the devil, as Sir Alex might just pull it, of <laughs> getting rid of a football agent and getting a pop star agent to run his it's football true. career yeah. on it. And it affected him at Manchester United. And that's why in the end he had to move on with other little things going on as well. And... I think Dave, he'll, he'll get to a point, um, I might have gone off track here, he'll get to a point, he'll look back in his career and he'll have regrets, in my opinion, about what he should have done to what he actually done. I think that's great. I could listen to Paul all day. I'm mean, <laughs> sitting here completely enraptured by it. I completely concur with Paul. Obviously, I don't have the first-hand experience, but I do have second-hand experience because I was there during the transitional period. I, I met three Beckhams almost. I actually met three Beckhams. The first David Beckham I met was still the footballer, and that was in 2001. That was in Kuala Lumpur, and I'll never forget it because Paddy Harverson, was he there when you was there? No. Paddy Harverson was the PR boss of Man U at that time. He then left to work with Prince Charles, would you believe? He set up this one-on-one <laughs> -on -one interview that I had with Beckham. At that time, that was the only only one-on-one -on -one interview with Beckham in the world because Beckham at that time wasn't speaking to the British press at all. I was working for a Singapore newspaper who was sponsoring this Mickey Mouse tournament in Kuala Lumpur and therefore I had this one-on-one -on -one interview. And Beckham is standing, you know, where Ash is away from me, not knowing who I am, obviously, and I argue with Paddy. I'm not doing this interview. He was saying it in more colourful language than that. I'm not doing this interview. I'm not doing it. It's always me. Why don't you want to speak to Gary Neville? Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> why, why don't you want to speak to Neville? Why don't you want to speak to Nicky? Why is it always me? Why is it always blah, blah, blah? And he's, he's screaming abuse and he, and he storms off back to his room. Anyway, five minutes later, I get the tap on the shoulder. I'm in the press conference with Alex Ferguson. He'll, he's ready for you now. It was like meeting royalty. So I go up <laughs> and sure enough, one-on-one -on -one interview, 45 minutes with the guy. You know, you try not to put the guy to sleep and I ended the interview. That's always a good sign. You know, I ended the interview. He wasn't like looking at his watch or whatever. And we had a chat. I mean, I'm from uh, uh, up the road from him. My family's from Forest Gate. His family's from Stratford. That's next door to each other. So we had a bit in common. We were chatting. And it was all about football. That's all he wanted to talk about. It was 2001. He was still Beckham the footballer. It was the transitional period that Paul mentions. Next time I meet him, or next time I come across him, 2003, he goes to Real Madrid. And in Singapore, I do a live link-up interview as he's unveiled as a Real Madrid uh, footballer live for Channel News Asia. And it was interesting. All the questions I was getting, both from the Channel News Asia guy and the guy in Spain, was about the brand, the brand, the brand. That's all I kept hearing out, the brand, the brand, how many shirts he was going to sell. So Beckham had already become Beckham the brand. He wasn't a footballer anymore. The last time I actually met Beckham, 2005, in Singapore, he was neither the footballer nor the brand. He was ambassador for any worthy cause. That was Beckham's 
new he thing. He was a Victorian. He was an right? ambassador for any worthy cause. And I'm not making this up. I sat down with Beckham, as close as you are now, and I got a, this is absolutely true. It was for the IOC yeah. London 2012 Olympic bid here in Singapore. He was an ambassador with Sven Joran Eriksson. Why Eriksson was an ambassador <laughs> for London 2012, I'll never know. But anyway, I'm sitting next to him and I got a whisper in the ear just before the interview no questions about football. <laughs> So I'm sitting outside, opposite the circle. world's most fo- famous footballer and I'm told no questions about football. That is how far David Beckham had changed. When you're sitting opposite the world's most famous footballer and you're not allowed to ask him a single question about the sport itself, something could change. And that's four years from yeah. 2001 yeah. to 2005. The guy in 2001, even though he was a global superstar, only wanted to talk about football, 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 football. Real Madrid, the players he loved, players he admires, players he grew up with, Brian Robson, Bobby Charlton. 2005, I couldn't say a thing about football. Well, well Ash, let's bring you in here because you are a bit of a, an icon you've got a brand football eater you know, and Beckham has become a brand but why does he resonate so well with people outside football circles entertainment circles women people uh, you know outside football's uh, traditional uh, areas well I want to say David is the only you know the the Beckham brand consists of not just David, it's Victoria as well. I think without the Victoria, there wouldn't be a Beckham brand because Victoria started out the whole wag Magnus, you know, that whole, she was the one who kick-started that. And now everybody, I mean, every single young girl in, the, in England, for example, I was reading an article in the Daily Mail, I know, but, but it, was, it was an article that said that that's the aspiration of every young girl, which is really unhealthy, I think, but she started out this whole glamorous thing. Everybody wants to be a footballer now. And I think he started, because of his brand, he's so powerful, everybody thinks that being with a footballer equals to, you know, glamour, and success and everything and, and I think Beckham's brand has totally changed how we look at football you know, and how people especially girls consume football without David without Beck- the Be- Victoria there wouldn't be any of this right now there wouldn't be any of this like whack magnets at the 2006 mm, World Cup he started Cup. it all but I think it's fascinating yeah. because you, you're absolutely right Like when he was in LA he was on the Ellen DeGeneres show every exactly, five minutes and everyone's <laughs> saying wow he's on Ellen DeGeneres and he's on Letterman he's the first English footballer to ever be on Letterman and you can see a certain new generation going wow good for Beckham but I can see another generation maybe Maybe Paul's generation or Gary Neville's generation or even Paul Scholes they're the same generation just kind of nodding their head it's almost like the George Best argument David where did it all go wrong yeah. you know you're on Letterman but Dave where did it all go wrong son Parks what inkling did you have about this showbiz side of uh, David Beckham you know was there any comment that he made as you drove him uh, you know between London and the north anything that kind of came out no nothing did at he have all. any flair that, no, no no it was nothing he was an ordinary lad he used to go out He's go out and get himself good-looking girls, but I noticed it one, Victoria. Uh, yeah, noticed it one time when there was an incident with um, somebody who one of the players was kind of in business with, and all of a sudden, another player, I'm not going to say the name, was going out of her, but all of a sudden, David started going out of her, and he was more concerned about going, he wanted to go out of her, but he was more concerned about turn up at the training ground in the morning in the mum's DB7 Aston Martin oh ok ok oh. so that, that was a sign of things and to there come. was another little bit there was another little bit where Sir Alex when he gets young players he gets them in even now and he put them on a contract a pro contract and he put a deal in it to get a car but you have to play yeah. a certain amount of games I heard about that yeah. yeah yeah. put a certain amount of games so what he works it and it tells you about the man is that that all of them practically do their time their games at the same time so all of a sudden we're sitting there at the cliff training ground and the big gates open because kept, we kept the, kept the fans out this time. And all of a sudden we think, why does that happen? All of a sudden these four cars roll in, four um, Honda Preludes will drive in and, and they park up and we're just kind of sitting there. And all of a sudden you could just see steam coming out of Sir Alex's head. He's just, he's going and you could see he, he storms out, he storms out the, the canteen, his chicken wing arms, because that's how his arms are like that. He walks out, if you watch him, he walks like that. And he goes outside and you can see him pointing his finger at this at the person. And what it was, Dave obviously knew he was getting these, has gone to the garage and decided that he was going to have big chrome wheels, black leather seats with white trims around them. Oh, okay. He wanted something special. He wanted something special. He didn't get it, though. He got sent straight back. <laughs> <laughs> Good done. answer, Alex. <laughs> well, Ryan Giggs, I always thought, said it, but when when Beckham did eventually leave the club and they asked Ryan Giggs the same question, had he changed? He said he was a flash cockney git when he came and he was a flash cockney <laughs> git when he left. So, well, another flashy guy, uh, Jose Mourinho, looks like it will be the second coming of the special one at uh, Stamford Bridge. Uh, second spell for him in charge of Chelsea. And they say going back 
to an old girlfriend, Ash, for the second time or an old partner <laughs> is never the same. Uh, how do you think it's going to end up uh, if it does all pan out as we expect? Well, Jose Mourinho, to be honest, he already it was he was really going to leave Real Madrid. I mean, if you look at the last Copa del Rey game, I mean, he had half the team was up there at the VIP Bernabeu box. They didn't, they didn't even know what was going on because he, he's already been fighting with Sergio Ramos, his captain, Casillas. This has been coming, you know, we're just a matter of time before he left. And like I told you, the IKEA boxer story as well, that was true. So I think Jose Mourinho, I think if he goes to Chelsea, he obviously, he, it's, he's, it's going to be a completely different team because now there's Hazard and there's Mata com- compared to the time when he was there in 2004. He, he, he won the, you know, the Cups with them. It's going to be really different. But I think he's going to be He's going to have to adapt to the new players, but it's going to be a lot easier for him as well because it's a different team. It's, a, it's not like Real Madrid. It's all individuals. Everyone is like, you know, there's um, Ronaldo there who's by himself and Alonso. They're all a team of indi- individuals. But I see Chelsea as well a little bit. You know, they have Mata and uh, they also have um, that Hazard as well. And they, they blend together really well, a lot more cohesive than Real Madrid, who are a team of you know mm. individuals. That's well, that I means see. he's going to ruin that then. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, he's going to get a yeah. big, strong, strapping lad. There's one at Porto. There's a, there's another one in Spain. He's going to get a big, big, strong, strapping lad. Even look, Le- Le- I can't even say Le- Lukaku. Yeah, Lukaku, Lukaku, yeah. Lukaku. Yeah. Lukaku. Back from West he Pong. looks a bit of a Mourinho type player yeah. actually. Big, strong like lad Drogba. up front. Yeah, he likes that. So the way to play at the moment, that's just not Mourinho yeah, way at exactly. all. It's just not. Yeah. The four, he likes the four-five-one. Big, big totem <laughs> pole up front who could knock the ball down to the yeah. on rushing midfielders, a Lampard type, and so on. Yep. I think he's on a bit of a hiding to nothing, Mourinho, because his stock has fallen a little bit. There's no doubt. Uh, about bit, it, yeah. um, you can't consider his his period at Real Madrid a massive success. He did win the title. I mean, that was an achievement. He did wrest the title away from Barcelona. But it's a it's a strange environment. I'm certain he fancied either the Manchester jobs. I still think he was angling for that. I think the Manchester United job going to Moyes was a personal letdown to Mourinho. I think he thought that was in the bag at some point in his career. It's never going to happen now. Where does he go at Chelsea? He wins the Champions League. Everyone shrugs their shoulders and says, "So what? <laughs> we expect it." You're Jose Mourinho, yeah. and Di Matteo did it too years ago been there seen it done it and he still got sacked so and, and this Roman Abramovich you don't know if he wins the treble Abramovich is going to want a second treble the next year and he's going to want Barcelona style football and he's going to want something else. Roman Abramovich will never be satisfied and he'll never be pacified so I don't see how Mourinho could be a massive success at this club second time round well <coughs> I think you said it all Neil about <laughs> that one you went right away through it at the end of the day I just I look at Mourinho and what he's doing it makes no sense at all for him his whole Ego, everything, for him to go there, it's been done. What he wanted to do, Di Matteo done it. So for him, if I was him, it's got to be PSG or City. They're the only two where there's a bit of a challenge, especially at City. The challenge at City is to get through the group stage of the Champions League. Then straight away is a martyr, if he can do that, given what Mancini done. Go to PSG, get into a Champions League final maybe, and win the league, of course, try and retain that. Get them to the peer, get them to the final of the Champions League. There's a challenge. Chelsea's not a challenge. It's an easy way out. Keep saying all oh, the fans love me and all the players, even Gary, he even wants Cahill. To go where he's, yeah. he's loved. <laughs> yeah, even yeah. Gary Cahill's coming out. I would like Mourinho here because he's scared to say any different because he knows the Chelsea fans will turn against yeah. him. John Terry's egging it on because he wants to. Get, he thinks he'll get a game of football. I think that's a great point about PSG and City because Mourinho likes a lot of money and no questions asked. And he gets that at Chelsea. He's always getting questions from upstairs. He doesn't like it. PSG, Man City, they're the only two clubs at the moment who have literally got more money than sense. They haven't got the first clue about <laughs> football, the owners, but they've got plenty of money to throw around. That's the problem. part of the problem with Mancini. They just kept throwing money at him, throwing money at him, and they didn't see that there was a real mutiny going on inside his dressing room that someone clued in, or Trixie Bell, whatever he's called. I always get <laughs> yeah. Trixie, Trixie <laughs> yeah, Bell got Trixie. onto it, and then they finally got rid of him. So uh, Manchester City, PSG, I'm with Paul. I think that's a good shout. Well, that's uh, Ash mentioned didn't end up uh, very happily uh, for Jose Mourinho at Real Madrid the course the season finishing in the cup with a defeat to Atletico Madrid so when we come back here on the Football Fever podcast we'll talk about Atletico Madrid making an historic tour of Singapore